Okay, kids. All right. So, what I want to do is that uh, just to make sure that you maintain the context of what it is we're doing. One, one of the things that I want to be able to contribute uh, here in, in this class is that for you to be able to maintain a strategic, tactical, as well as logistical uh, perception or perspective on what it is that's going on now in the country. That obviously, while we keep talking about the fact that global climate change is the big major issue <coughs> of the day, you keep getting overwhelmed every day with stuff about the uh, impeachment uh, and about all the hearings that are going on uh, in, in the, the House of Representatives primarily and the big debates going on about uh, whether, whether or not uh, William Barr will come and testify uh, uh, before, the, before the House uh, Judiciary Committee or the Oversight Committee or any others. Uh, and, uh, and the other issues of the Keystone uh, XL pipeline uh, and the other major pipelines, the Trans Mountain Pipeline and others, are kind of quietly in the background with litigation going on uh, you know, trying to stop the pipeline through the through the litigation process. What I what I'm in what I'm in the process of doing is I'm explaining uh, the connection uh, between this ongoing impeachment process uh, of uh, Donald Trump and connecting it to the global uh, climate change uh, crisis that we're facing, and I'm going to be linking that to the uprising of the indigenous people uh, against the pipeline up in North Dakota and the efforts that are being made by the, the various oil corporations around the world to suppress the indigenous people uh, in their area, in Africa, down in Ecuador, uh, other places where the major oil corporations are, are on uh, board uh, and uh, disappearing uh, some of the organizers uh, in the indigenous movements that are that are trying to challenge the threat to their water, uh, and I'm pointing out that uh, that my my thesis here uh, is that uh, despite the resistance to impeachment uh, on the part of the traditional Democratic Party leadership by Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer uh, and their obviously favored candidate of Joe Biden uh, that, they, that one ought not to impeach uh, Trump at all. One ought to uh, have a whole series of hearings going on rather consistently, uh, dragging up in front of various House committees different key witnesses and getting them to go on the record uh, stating things that have basically already been found uh, in the Mueller report because they're convinced that people won't read the Mueller report uh, and so that what they want to do is they want to dramatically reenact uh, the testimony of a number of key witnesses that were interviewed by Mueller that caused him to come to the conclusions he did. Uh, but, in, but what I'm saying is that, that despite that tactical decision that has been made by the traditional leadership of the Democratic uh, Party that the, uh, the new progressives in the Congress are pressing for impeachment. Uh, and they've now been reinforced in that demand by people such as Lawrence Tribe at Harvard University, the ranking constitutional scholar in the country. Uh, and he's come forward saying that that to allow Donald Trump to get away with what he's been doing uh, and not impeach him is going to establish such a horrible precedent that it would be impossible for uh, either political party to recover from this and actually mount an effective impeachment uh, against uh, any president, no matter how awful they might be assuming that they could be worse than Trump uh, has been, which is quite an assumption. Uh, but, but, the, but the fact is, is that there are, are demographics that I want to have you 
have the opportunity here in this class to get to know about that you might not otherwise know about, that even though the Democratic Party shifted the control of the House of Representatives, there are 435 members uh, in the House, and there used to be uh, used to be approximately 240 Republicans and 200 Democrats. Now they've reshifted it, having 240 Democrats and 200 Republicans. But that 40, the 40 seat uh, difference uh, between the two parties now uh, conceals the fact that there are actually 64 new uh, new Democrats uh, in the House of Representatives. Uh, many of the older Democrats were replaced by younger ones and more progressive uh, members. And so the, the membership in the, the progressive caucus in the House of Representatives has gone up to 98 members that are now in the, in the progressive caucus. Uh, so they're, they're knocking on the door right now. Of, uh, of They only need about 50 more uh, members of the Democratic uh, Progressive Caucus to take control of the, the Democratic Party uh, in the House of Representatives. So it's, it's a key spot right now. And the fact of the matter is that, that Alexandria Rojas, who is the executive director of the Justice Democrats, uh, who is a, a close associate with uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, has already announced that one of their plans is to target certain uh, incumbent Democrats uh, around the country who have been in office for three, four, five terms, uh, but are not supporting really progressive legislation to stop global climate change. And so that they've, they've seized upon this issue of global climate change and the Green New Deal as the lever that they're going to be using, uh, or the wedge actually they're going to be using to drive into the Democratic Party to get more progressives into the Democratic Party by challenging some of these more moderate incumbents, not in uh, red states or purple states, as they refer to them, where it's kind of a close call as to whether you're going to get a Republican or Democrat, but instead in the, in the congressional districts that are safe districts for the Democrats, uh, districts where they traditionally have been winning by 20, 25, 30 points uh, consistently over the last decade in those districts, and yet they've still got these really m extremely moderate to conservative Democrats in there. And what we've just found out is that the, the uh, Congressional uh, Campaign Committee, the House, uh, con the House Campaign Committee of the Democratic Party, the DCCC, has now just issued a fatwa, basically, that if anybody in the Democratic Party works for a person who is challenging an incumbent Democrat in the House, that they're going to be forbidden from ever having a job again in the Democratic Party. Now, so you can see that they're really starting to get worried already about what it is that's going on now with the, with the Justice Democrats. And what, what you're really looking at is that the Justice Democrat movement is basically a tactical decision that's been made by the, the Democratic Socialists, or the Social Democrats, as they're known, to not set up a separate party, and, and not sort of shift out of the Democratic Party and go into, for example, the Green Party. You know, you could take a lot of those candidates, they could have just as easily run as a Green Party candidate, but what they're doing is they're accepting the, the concept that the dialectic, or the bipolar debate uh, between the A team and B team is so kind of deeply ingrained in the American consciousness and psyche that unless you're a, a candidate for one of, those, uh, one of those two teams, you don't stand any realistic chance of winning because everybody's gonna view you as like a, a third party candidate and that it's a throwaway of your vote. So they've made a decision to come inside the Democratic Party uh, and run as Democrats, uh, led by, of course, Bernie Sanders, who, even though he's an independent and a democratic socialist from Vermont, uh, he's, he caucuses with the Democratic Party, and he runs for the Democratic Party nomination. Uh, and so the, the, the thesis that I'm setting forth for you is that I believe that this impeachment is likely to take place, 
and that it would be driven by these new younger progressives in the Democratic Party. But that this uh, present program of, uh, of uh, pushing for the uh, impeachment of Trump uh, uh, by the congressional newcomers and to be candid about it, uh, even by MSNBC uh, and CNN, <laughs> to be perfectly fair to Trump, uh, is that there's no doubt at all that you tune into MSNBC and starting from five o'clock in the evening all the way through to midnight, one news show after another is just in the business of excoriating Trump uh, and, and uh, basically running around with their hair on fire uh, talking about how it's necessary to impeach this guy. Uh, and so, but, so despite that kind of strong uh, urging on the part of MSNBC and even CNN, uh, and the progressives in the Democratic Party, uh, it's not likely that they're going to be able to succeed in doing anything other than getting him impeached in the House of Representatives. It's not likely that they're going to be able to, the progressives are not likely to be able to convince the, an adequate number of, uh, of senators uh, in the Republican-dominated Senate to vote to convict him. And so therefore, what's, what's uh, under the present set of circumstances, what's likely to happen is that the impeachment will take place in the House. He'll go up to the, the Senate side, but the, the Republicans will, will refuse to convict him. Uh, and the, the moderate Democrats are arguing that that is going to give uh, Donald Trump an actual chance of winning. Uh, the election in 2020, because if you don't succeed in impeaching him and getting him out of office, he's inevitably going to be the Republican Party nominee, uh, and, uh, and therefore uh, he's going to have a chance of winning because the impeachment process will have enraged his uh, base uh, so dramatically, and the failure of the conviction is going to be presented by the Trump administration and the Republican Party as a demonstration of the fact that he is innocent, because that's how people perceive it. If you're acquitted in a trial, you are innocent. Uh, and if you're not, only if, if you're not convicted, then you were either unjustly charged or else it was a, it was, it was a witch hunt of some sort against you. Uh, and so that the, the, the problem is right now that, the, the, that uh, this process on the part of the progressive Democrats uh, and the more progressive television news stations to get him impeached, according to their scenario, is running the risk of, of having him have a, have a real chance of winning the election. Uh, and they're, they're going to be arguing that not only was the impeachment by the progressives the wrong thing to do because it inflamed his base uh, and gave him this kind of victim uh, image that he could appeal to in the campaign. But they're also going to be arguing that, look, you progressives ran so many candidates uh, in the primary that you basically drowned out the voice uh, of Joe Biden, who is their candidate. Uh, and the, the, they would like to have just a simple one-on-one -on -one in the Democratic primary between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. So that they could say, well, you can't vote socialist because that's going to give Trump the, the ability to argue that the Democratic Party is now socialist. Uh, and he's going to equate that to communism and authoritarianism and uh, in Stalin and Nazis and everything else. Uh, and that therefore they're, they're blaming the progressives. They're doing everything they can do to get the progressives to stop doing this. Uh, as I say, they, they want to have a one-on-one -on -one between Bernie Sanders, uh, Sanders and, uh, and Joe Biden. Uh, and they don't want Joe Biden injured in the process that's going to somehow impair his ability to beat Trump. And so you can see what's happening is, well, almost all of the other 20 candidates uh, that are or the 19 other candidates are kind of stepping around this question of whether they're going to be calling for immediate impeachment or not. What you see is Joe Biden is instead going right straight at Trump. 
uh, and criticizing Trump and telling people that you got to get rid of Trump and he's better than Trump and it's time to have an honest president, uh, someone that can be trusted in the international field. He, that, that Biden's theory is to go right straight at Trump, whereas almost all the other folks are talking about their policies. Let's not focus just on beating Trump. Let's talk about what we're going to do positively. Let's have the Green New Deal. Let's have health care for all. Uh, let's have a free uh, uh, state public school education at the college level. Uh, let, let's, do, uh, let's do these positive, concrete things. Let's not get caught just attacking Trump. So, so, the, so the question is, uh, what, what is it that, that we are proposing that we do to try to prevent this type of a scenario from taking place. And what, what I have proposed is that, that we need to get past the temporary success that William Barr has had in selling this trope that, uh, oh, there was no evidence uh, of any collusion. Uh, and that the, the real standard that has to be met is criminal conspiracy and there's no real ability to prove beyond a reasonable doubt all of these technical uh, conditions that you need to get to have a conviction for criminal conspiracy. And so let's just set that aside and let's all just focus on the obstruction. Let's just focus on these 10 different candidates for obstruction, which if you turn on the news on, on almost any of these uh, cable stations now, except for Fox, all you're going to do is be hearing about these 10 candidates. Here are these 10 different instances in which he took steps, uh, Trump took steps to obstruct the investigation. And they're going to be championing uh, uh, Don uh, McGahn to come on to be the star witness because he's the key witness to probably half of those uh, incidents of the obstruction efforts of ordering him to fire the special prosecutor, then ordering him to lie about the fact that he wasn't ordered to, to, to fire the special prosecutor, uh, uh, et cetera. So what, what I've proposed is that, that uh, we look at the collusion, look at the evidence of, uh, of the answer to this mystery that is at the core of this entire process against Trump is, why in the world is, is Trump acting this way uh, toward Putin and toward Russia? Why is he acting like that? Uh, and uh, what, what, what I propose is that, that we, rather than constantly drilling down on some of these tempting ones about how he was involved in laundering funds for the oligarchs through his towers, you know, how he was in fact dependent upon the loans from the banks where the oligarchs were putting their money that they'd embezzled in, in Russia. Uh, and so therefore he's beholden to them in some general way, is that I think that the, that the two candidates that we have to take a look at uh, to answer the, the fundamental question of what is the underlying mystery uh, that explains what the, the love affair is that Trump has with Putin, uh, which would justify the obstructing steps that he was taking. Because what I'm pointing out is that just to point out that he's obstructing uh, the investigation, what's going to happen is that if that's all you have and you don't answer the fundamental question as to why it is that he was trying to cover up something or what was it he was trying to cover up, if you can't prove that to the people, they're just going to think this is some weird technicality that okay, so he was, he was refusing to cooperate, so he was obstructing, so what? Uh, if you can't prove the underlying crime that he was trying to conceal, the American people, at least a, a critical mass of them, are not really going to go for this. So that, what, what I'm saying is that you, you really need to get down to uh, proving uh, what the underlying uh, major sin is of which he was guilty that is motivating him to try to conceal uh, and what is motivating him to constantly be extolling Putin uh, and excusing Putin and taking Putin's word over his own intelligence people about even unto the point of, the, of, of refusing to acknowledge that they were really interfering in the election. And what you hear going on now is him saying that, or all the news people saying that, 
that no one is allowed to talk about inside the White House the fact that the Russians were attempting to intervene in the election to get him elected. No matter how much evidence there is, because he thinks that undermines the legitimacy of his election. And so he doesn't want anybody talking about it. So what he's doing is he's, he's pushing back against the charges that the Russians uh, intervened in the election at all. And therefore, he's doing nothing about it. He's not taking any steps at all to try to exercise leadership in stopping Russia from intervening in the election in 2020 to his benefit. Uh, and, uh, and so that you get this weird situation going on where there are some of the executive branch agencies, Homeland Security and FBI and uh, others, that are trying to figure out some set of protocols to impose to protect the election in 2020 against Russian interference. Uh, but because Trump is not exercising any kind of leadership in this, in this field, that not only are they openly inviting Russia to come in to try to assist Trump in getting elected uh, in 2020, but others may well uh, be tempted to come in, such as China uh, and Iran, uh, both of whom who have some fairly muscled up capacities in this area of cyber warfare. Uh, so that they may all pile on in the 2020 election. And it's perfectly evident that it's to their advantage to have Trump elected again. Not only because Trump uh, is, is uh, catering to all of the interest of Russia for whatever the mysterious reason is, uh, but also he is so disruptive of, of American foreign policy uh, and he is so reluctant to pursue what is characterized by the intelligence community and the national security state bureaucracy as the interests of the United States uh, all around the world, uh, that China loves having him be there uh, in the presidency, and uh, Russia loves having him be in the presidency because he is such an incompetent fool. Yes, Grant. Yes, yes. I, I think, I think that what's, what's happening is that the tariffs, while they're, they're troublesome to China, I mean, China's sitting on holding nine-tenths of all the national debt of the United States. They're, they're not worried about some temporary, you know, they play the long game. And the, the, there may be some temporary discomfiture on their part uh, with these tariffs, but the fact is it's a, it's a terrible policy on the part of the United States. Uh, and it's not going to do anything to help the American economy. And the, the China, if you assume that China is engaged in the effort to become the, the, the primary power on the planet, which I think is a fairly safe assumption, uh, then they're, they're, not, they're not engaged in a one-on-one -on -one head to head with the United States. They're not playing checkers against the United States. They're not even playing chess against the United States. They're not even pay, playing three-dimensional chess against the United States. They're playing the game of Go, which is completely different. Uh, you just sort of lay back and you surround the adversary and just surround them and choke them off. And so that having a, a nincompoop like this uh, as the president of the United States is much to their advantage as well. And all they're going to have to do is conceal their cyber attacks on our election process as Russian attacks. And that's all they have to do. And, the, and the, they're, they're going to be doubling and tripling the effect uh, on the election. And the problem is that one of the tactics, as you know, that Russia adopted in its intervening in the election is to exacerbate the schisms inside our country to exacerbate the racial uh, issue, to exacerbate the economic disparity issue, to exacerbate the right-wing fascist you know, skinheads uh, uh, issue, to, uh, to point out the injustice of the American system of having uh, disparate amounts of pay for women to men. Uh, to, the, the, there, there are enough natural fissures in the American body politic for them to recognize and to, to push in and wedge into those issue areas and disrupt the entire American people. 
that, I mean, that, that this, this last two years uh, has been uh, almost unlike uh, any period since the McCarthy era uh, in the United States. With, and, and, and people are all getting angry at each other. There's a whole lot of horizontal anger going on now. Uh, and, and so that people are taking their eye off the ball that there's this 1% of the major corporate stockholders and management officials uh, that are getting some 49% of all the newly generated wealth in the country. Uh, and, and people are losing, people are getting distracted into all these other issues in some part because of the intervention of Russia uh, into the electoral process. And now that could be exacerbated by China and perhaps even Iran. So, so what, what, I have, what I have said is that I think what we need to do is to, is to focus on two of the potential explanations for the, this uh, mystery, uh, the, the big uh, mortal sin, if you will, that's underlying the entire uh, Trump uh, conspiracy theories here is what is it that's really going on? My opinion is that if the most that you're going to be able to show is that he was in fact uh, taking loans from the Deutsche Bank and they were using money from the Russian oligarchs that were on deposit in the, in the bank, that that's going to be another one of those things where even Mueller wouldn't be able to find evidence enough to convict him. Because you know, if Trump is, they're, they're in a sense laundering those funds through the Deutsche Bank. They're, they're depositing their funds, the, the Russian oligarchs, in the Deutsche Bank. The Deutsche Bank, therefore, has the authority to loan the money out. They loan the money to Trump. Trump builds the Trump Towers. He ends up paying them back the loans. Uh, and then the money is laundered for the oligarchs. And uh, there's no fingerprints on this thing. And so the, if, that's the, if that's the relationship that he has, uh, the, the relationship in which he's sort of beholden to the oligarchs, that's a little too uh, difficult to prove a, a formal agreement, a formal agreement between the oligarchs and Trump that he's going to get their money loaned to him, okay? Because you've got this washing process going on with the Deutsche Bank. And, uh, and uh, so, so the, the, uh, the, the, other, the other issue is the money laundering on the part of the oligarchs through his towers themselves. And that is, he builds, he gets the loan from the Deutsche Bank, he builds two or three of these gigantic towers filled with condominiums. The Russian oligarchs come in and buy, you know, five or six, I've mentioned before, I mentioned, buy five or six of these condominiums for like $8 million each and turn around and sell them for six or $7 million uh, at a loss, but they're laundering their money. Uh, and the, the fact of the matter is, it's gonna be very, very difficult to prove that there's any kind of criminal conspiracy going on there. Because it's to the advantage of Trump to, to sell the, the condominiums, to get them all sold out. And if he's selling them to Russian oligarchs, uh, there's no law against that. And so that neither one of those, those types of activities are going to be able to convince the American people that he should be impeached. Because what, you, what you're going to have to do, the, the secret in getting a president effectively impeached, and as you know, that none of them have been convicted. That Johnson wasn't convicted uh, back in the, in the, the 19th century, uh, and, and Clinton wasn't convicted. Nixon never ended up getting convicted because he quit. Uh, and so the, the, the ability to get them a president convicted in the Senate is a very difficult thing, uh, more difficult than getting him just impeached or charged uh, with this offense. So the, the, in order to actually get a president successfully impeached and convicted, I believe that what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to put evidence forward uh, that in fact disempowers him from being able to govern. You, you have to be able to undermine his, his integrity and authority with the American people to the point where he, he cannot really govern. And there's only two of the, of the 10, uh, or the, not the 10 obstruction things, but two of the four or five different theories as to what explains what the underlying sin is that he's trying to conceal here. 
The two of them are, that with regard to the Russian interference in the election, it's going to be necessary to prove, as I mentioned before, it will be necessary to prove that the particular polling data uh, that was, that was uh, given uh, by, by Manafort, uh, that was given to the, the Russian spy, uh, relating to Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, was actually used by the Russians to effectively interfere with the voting in those three states so as to delegitimize his actual election itself. Uh, and, and as you noted, that uh, Mueller did not investigate that part. He found out about the meeting, he knew what the data was that they gave them, but he hasn't followed it up. He just assigned that investigation to the FBI. And as of yet, we haven't heard anything about that. All we know is that Mueller said that at the present time, uh, he wasn't in possession of adequate evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of some specific agreement that actually resulted in, in delegitimatizing the election. And so that if the FBI were to come up with proof that active steps were taken by Russia to use that polling data to actually target particular areas in, in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan, and actually, for example, penetrated the voting machines where they changed the data, that they put in all the big social media campaign to give the cover for the change in the vote, but that they actually somehow got into those machines and manipulated those votes to change it, uh, it's going to be hard to prove that one. Uh, but, it's, but it's one that would work, okay? So the, so the other one that we're talking about right now, and the one that you haven't really heard about other than here, uh, is this peculiar uh, sale of the Russian National Oil Company. Uh, the, the purchase of Rose, Rose, Rosneft, is R-O-S-N-E-F-T. The Rosneft uh, Oil and, and Gas Company, which was the, the uh, government-owned oil and gas company in Russia that was sold in 2016 uh, to these five different groups, 20% uh, interest in each of them, uh, and that we know that Qatar bought 20%, we know that ExxonMobil bought 20%, uh, and, and we know that, that uh, Rex Tillerson uh, was the CEO of ExxonMobil at the time, and he was given the Friendship of Russia Award, the highest award that this uh, Russian country ever gives to a non-Russian citizen. Uh, and then Trump made him his Secretary of State. And this would go uh, a great distance in explaining uh, the oil corporation cabinet uh, that uh, Trump put into place, with not only with Rex Tillerson as the CEO of ExxonMobil, but Rick Perry this is his Secretary of Energy from Texas, the oil state of Texas, who is a vice president of Sunoco uh, Logistics. Uh, Scott Pruitt, who was the Attorney General from Oklahoma and had filed any number of major lawsuits against the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, putting him in charge of the Environmental Protection Agency, and then putting Eric Prince's uh, sister in as the, uh, the Secretary of Education, and Eric Prince being the CEO and founder of Blackwater International, a spin-off of which, Tiger Swan Private Military Corporation, is now the armed brown shirt operation for the major oil corporations. Uh, that this, and then it also goes a long ways in explaining the kind of Russophile uh, elements that were all put in the National Security Advisory Committee by Trump. Guys like Paul Manafort, Paul Manafort became his campaign uh, chairman, but he was previously uh, in the National Security Advisory Committee, and he was a longtime multi-million dollar paid uh, lobbyist uh, for the Russian sympathetic, sympathetic government in the Ukraine. Uh, and, and Mike Flynn and uh, George Papandopoulos uh, and this other fellow, but even General Joseph Schmitz, uh, these were all people put on the National Security Advisory Committee, 
and he was involved in selling Russian arms in the Middle East. Uh, and so that these, these people uh, all show up at this small group meeting of 24 people on April 27th uh, at the Center for the National Interest in Washington, D.C., when, uh, when Trump made his very first foreign policy speech. And his foreign policy speech was just filled with praise for, the, for Russia and for the need to have a closer relationship and partnership with Russia. And this, this entire thing took place following this, this closed door VIP cocktail party where 24 people were all present, almost all of whom were directly involved in the sale and purchase of the oil corporation for Russia. Uh, and that what I'm saying is that that one group, there's a group, uh, a secret Cayman Islands based group uh, called the uh, Intertrust Group that nobody knows who the fiduciaries are. Nobody knows who in fact are the beneficiaries of that secret trust. <clears throat> what we do know is that the law firm that represented them in the Cayman Islands, the Walker's uh, law firm, uh, is, uh, is closely associated with Stephen Schwartzman. And Stephen Schwartzman is one of the close economic advisors for Donald Trump. Uh, and we also know that at that meeting of 24 people was <clears throat> Bud McFarlane. And that Bud McFarlane, uh, right after that, in June, that meeting was on April 27th of 2016. In June, the June issue uh, of the National Interest, which is the magazine for that group, uh, that Bud McFarland wrote a major article in which he stated, as I told you, that Russia will become an integra integral partner of the United States in ensuring the energy security of the Western world. Uh, and so that this, this echoes very much uh, of two things that I pointed out to you. Uh, one of them is the, this major article that was written by Samuel P. Huntington. Samuel P. Huntington was the, the uh, editor of the Foreign Affairs magazine uh, for the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, uh, in which he wrote this uh, major article called The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order. And what he proposed is that Russia and the United States and the other Caucasian countries uh, of the West should all get together and form a major new alliance uh, against China uh, and the, what he called the, the new Asian empire uh, that will be rising in the second half of the 21st century all under the hegemony of China. And that therefore, if we're going to forestall <coughs> China becoming the dominant power in the world, which of course is our job uh, <laughs> from their point of view, uh, we, we have to com combine together and get over <clears throat> all of this multiculturalism, uh, all of these kind of multiple diverse religions and toleration of all these different religions and, and different ethnic groups, etc., in return to the basic white Christian male-dominated culture that made us great before. Uh, even under the point of suggesting that rather than just become a Christian uh, coalition, it should be Catholic, okay? And that therefore that he, they're espousing that the Russian Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church come back into union with the, Ro with the Roman rite of the Catholic Church and that they become the dominant religion and so that you have a full culture uh, with the same religion, the same racial makeup, uh, the, the minority groups be spun off to the extent to which they could. Uh, I, I'm telling you, this is downright frightening because Samuel P. Huntington, at the time he wrote that article, in later the much longer book of the same title, The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order, he was in fact the president of the American Academy of Political Science. Uh, and he was the editor-in-chief of Foreign Affairs Magazine, the Council on Foreign Relations, and he was the ranking Harvard uh, University scholar on international relations. So I mean, this is, this is not a small thing that we're talking about here. 
And I pointed out to you that this same ethos was reflected in the, the I mentioned the 1992 United States Defense Department policy planning guidance document that was drafted right at the end of the Cold War. As soon as the Cold War ended at the end of 1991, December 31st of 1991, there was a, a set of meetings that took place in the West Wing of the White House under the George Bush Sr. administration <coughs> under the aegis of his Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, uh, and his deputy, Paul Wolfowitz, uh, and uh, Scooter Libby, and, uh, and Doug Fife, and David Addington, uh, and Elliot Abrams. And they, they had a meeting in which they actually drafted up uh, a, a 1992 United States Defense Department policy planning guidance document openly, secretly actually, but flagrantly advocating the establishment of full spectrum dominance on the part of the United States over the entire planet so that we could assert our military power and superiority over any other nation state or any other non-state actor on the planet. Uh, and that that the only thing that changed in that after it, it leaked out that what they were planning, that George Bush Sr. Uh, and Theodore Shackley, his director of covert operations when he was the director of the CIA from 1975 to 1977, that they co-authored a second iteration of that in which they just shifted from having it be unilaterally undertaken on the part of the United States to undertaking it on a multilateral level with the United States Canada, Mexico, under the dominance of the PRI, the Castilian Spanish uh, uh, party in, in Mexico, the UK, France, Italy, Spain, uh, uh, in the new reunified Germany now at the end of the Cold War, and Russia, if they were willing to participate in this, Russia, now that it had spun off all of its ethnic provinces is the exact quote. Uh, and so it's perfectly evident what it is that they're doing there. Uh, <clears throat> they're basically following out the same scenario as was being recommended by uh, Samuel Huntington. Yes, Graham. So, so that's a quote from the, the 1992 United States Defense Department Policy Plan Guides. That was the second iteration of it. So there, there was an ethnic um, emphasis in that policy. Directly. I mean, that is the quote. Uh, that, that Russia could be invited to come in now to participate in this new Northern Industrial Alliance now that they have spun off all of their ethnic provinces. And they specifically pointed out, to get back to the core point here, that the purpose of this new Northern Industrial Alliance would be to maintain the continued privileged access to the strategic raw materials needed by the member states of this new Northern Industrial Alliance. And that is oil. And that goes all the way back. Uh, and that's why I'd recommend it to you that you might get a look at the book called The Prize uh, that, uh, that actually lays out the whole history of the, the concomitant rise of oil as the basis of power, military power, engineering the military you know, in the rise of capitalism uh, in Western civilization. That, that's, the, that's the key to this thing. And that's why that, that when you know all of that stuff and you see the footprints in the snow here that we see in front of us of this meeting on April 27th and the personnel that were there in the sale of this, uh, this private, uh, this former Russian-owned company, and you see that the, the major portion of the wealth that was owned by that company is in fact off the Arctic shelf in the 15-mile economic zone of Russia <clears throat> that requires further global climate change to start melting off more and more of that ice so they can get at the 87 billion barrels of oil and the 30% of all of the natural gas on the planet, uh, which they value at some $10 trillion. And so the, the question of who this secret partner is in the ownership now, the private ownership of that former Russian national oil and gas company is critical 
Because if Trump is part of that alliance and Putin is part of that alliance privately, then that answers the question. And it answers the question not only of why they would be having this peculiar love affair and be meeting in secret with no one else uh, available to talk with them uh, or understand what they're talking about, but, but also why it is that Donald Trump, in the face of all of the overwhelming evidence, keeps on saying there's no such thing as global climate change and keeps on insisting upon doubling and quadrupling the amount of oil and natural gas that is put into production in the world uh, so that they can, the, so that the Western powers can dominate uh, the world and keep China from taking over and deprive China of, of the oil. And at the same time, China is now, as you may know, threatening to build 30 million new electric cars so that they can, in fact, cut into the demand for oil in the world to try to undermine what it is that the Western powers are trying to do here. Okay, So that this is the strategic play uh, that is going on, uh, and, it is a, it, and it is something that the regular leadership of both the Republican and Democratic parties are going to try to keep secret. Because this, is, this, this process of getting access and control over the petroleum on the planet has been going on as a shared mission on the part of the Republican and Democratic Party you know, ever since the end of World War I. And you can see that, again, in that book, The Prize, where they talk about, about this. Uh, and so the, what, what I wanted to do is I wanted to, to point out to you that this, this type of a, a deep, dark secret that's going on at the base of this conflict that is taking place between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party now, the so-called Hamiltonian Party of the Republicans, of the financiers and the bankers and the industrialists and the, the capitalists, and on the other hand, the, the Madisonians, uh, that are more regional and local uh, in, their, in their scope and not as dedicated to uh, the, the mercantile industry, that these, these types of confrontations almost always are, are concealing some deeper source of the conflict that is going on. And that's, that's what we have happening here. And so what I did is I started out uh, <clears throat> last Thursday explaining to you the deeper story behind the Watergate burglary. That, that the fact, as I pointed out to you, is that the, the Republican and Democratic Party, that is Nixon uh, in the Eisenhower administration, running the covert operations uh, for the 5412 Committee, the National Security Council, uh, in creating this political assassination operation going on around the world uh, that was known about by Lyndon Johnson and Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon both together mounting this Vietnam War uh, in maintaining the Vietnam War. Uh, in the, the John F. Kennedy was in the process of trying to withdraw U.S. military forces from uh, Vietnam. Uh, but Lyndon Johnson and Nixon both in the Republican and Democratic Party at that time, the regular traditional Democratic Party that was rooted in Houston and in Texas, in the oil corporations down there, that element of the Democratic Party, they were all devoted to supporting the war in Vietnam because what they wanted to do is they wanted to get a military foothold into Asia. That uh, they had, it was the same reason that they invaded the, uh, the Korean Peninsula uh, is to try to get a, a land base in there. And so they were trying to get a land base closer to China and so that they, they set up this completely artificial uh, entity of South Vietnam that never existed at all <clears throat> and, and fabricated this, this, con this country and brought in a graduate student from Columbia University, Neo Din Diem, and put him in charge and said, oh, now there's a new democratic uh, government in, in South Vietnam. And the, the reason I'm raising all of this is because what I'm asserting to you is that it was the Vietnam War that undermined Richard Nixon. 
It wasn't just that he obstructed justice. I mean, they do that all the time. And it wasn't just that he burglarized people's offices. Or they do that all the time. But the, the really fundamental thing is that he had lost his ability to govern because of this fundamental conflict that was going on in the war in Vietnam. And the, that uh, the, the people were marching in the streets. An entire generation was rising up against him. Uh, they were starting to resort to violence by forming the Weathermen and the, the Black Panther Party and others. And a larger and larger percentage of the intelligentsia uh, in, the, in the university communities uh, around the country were starting to sympathize with the need to take radical action even unto the application of violence, mostly ad, you know, anti-material violence, uh, but that they were engaged in that type of a process and they were pushing the country to the brink of, of civil war. And, and that's what was really going on. So beneath the, the weakening of Richard Nixon, in fact, they just had uh, a, a debate that was going on uh, last Thursday, I guess it was, Thursday evening, that they were, they were talking about uh, the comparison between the Watergate uh, scandal in the, the ultimate prepared impeachment of Richard Nixon and Trump right now, and the, two of the commentators actually said, well, you know, the real reason for that was Richard Nixon. As soon as the Pentagon Papers were published, you know, the whole bottom started falling out of the Vietnam War. The whole legitimacy of the, of the war in Vietnam started to collapse with the revelation of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and so, so Richard Nixon was losing his power base uh, because it turns out that the protesters against the Vietnam War ended up being shown to be telling the truth, that this is not a, a, a championing of democratic principles in South Vietnam. It's not an attempt to, you know, to go to the aid of some poor defenseless country that's being overrun by communists from the North. This is a blatant set of imperialist activities. And, that they, and it showed in the Pentagon Papers that, uh, that Lyndon Johnson had totally fabricated the Bay of Tonkin Resolution uh, and it put false information in front of the Congress to get the, the Tonkin uh, resolution from Congress that he used to justify sending 500,000 U.S. military troops into Southeast Asia. Uh, and, so that, uh, and it revealed the existence of uh, heroin trafficking, opium trafficking, political assassination programs, etc. And all of this stuff is revealed in the Pentagon Papers. And by that time, Richard Nixon had come to basically own that war. Uh, and because of that, that the, the entire threat of the splitting of the, of the country uh, was right at the doorstep of Richard Nixon. And so when Richard Nixon got caught doing these other things, he didn't have the kind of political support that would be necessary to fight off a, uh, a, an impeachment process like that. Uh, and so that, so that what I'm saying here is that, what I'm trying to point out is, is that the analogy here to the Trump impeachment process is the issue of global climate change. Is that the fact of the matter is that the world now is being confronted with the phenomenon of global climate change. And it is, it is in fact the, the massive burning of petroleum uh, in fossil fuels that is the proximate causation of the global climate change. And if in fact we can show that, uh, that Donald Trump is directly involved with Putin in a, the biggest oil sale in the history of the human family, here right in the face of global climate change, it is the kind of discovery that could drop the complete bottom out of his support. Uh, and the, that's, that's the reason I'm, I'm raising this now. And, uh, and I, I, I don't want to go uh, way off uh, uh, giving you huge amount of detail, which I'm tempted to do, but I'm trying to control myself, of all kinds of information about the Watergate burglary uh, and similar information about the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, as you know, I was, I was directly involved in both of them that I was uh, in the law firm of F. Lee Bailey, where we were representing James McCord, who was the Watergate uh, burglar, who was the wiretap specialist for the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, it was our office that got him to write the letter to Judge Sirica, blowing the whistle 
on Richard Nixon and the plumbers unit. Uh, so I was there, first-hand witness to the disintegration uh, of the Nixon administration and uh, had been asked by Chuck Morgan, the, the uh, director of the National Office of the American Civil Liberties Union in Washington, to actually write the original draft for the articles of impeachment for Richard Nixon. Uh, so I was there when all of that was going on and was privy to the kind of information which I've shared with you uh, earlier about what it is that was really going on there, that, that, the, that it all came back to the discovery of the check in Bernard Barker's pocket that was not only representing funds that had in fact originated with Creep, the committee to reelect the president, uh, and found in the pocket of the burglar, which was enough, of course, to get rid of him. But in fact, it was drafted on the bank of the Banco Internacional in Mexico City on the bank account of the lawyer, uh, Manuel Ogario, which was the same bank account into which the money was put uh, that was skimmed off the casinos by the mob out in Vegas and deposited in the Miami National Bank. Uh, and then it was wired into the International Credit Bank in Geneva, Switzerland, and a whole fund was set up down in Mexico City <coughs> where they were financing the political assassination team that was assigned to kill Fidel Castro. It was that very bank account from which the check came that was in Bernard Barker's pocket. And it was the fact that Mark Felt, the number two man in the FBI, was on uh, June 24th, of, of 1972, scheduled to fly out of Washington, D.C. to go down to Mexico City to investigate that particular bank account uh, that was freaking them all out. And that's when Pat Gray called the White House and talked to John Dean and, and told him that, look, I've got the FBI is out from under my control. Mark Felt is getting ready to fly out tomorrow to go down to investigate this bank account down in Mexico City where the check came from. And uh, Pat Gray was asking John Dean to go talk to Nixon and find out if that's going to cause any trouble. And that's what happened. John Dean came and talked to Bob Haldeman, told him what was getting ready to happen. Haldeman comes in to talk to Richard Nixon. And then there's the famous conversation, the smoking gun conversation. And it was the investigation of the bank the, the, the attempt on the part of Mark Felt to go down and investigate the bank in that account that caused Richard Nixon to freak out. And he said, you've got to stop it right now. Stop that part of the investigation right now. So Bob Haldeman, you go over and get John Ehrlichman, and you both go over across the river to the agency and see Dick Helms and Vernon Walters and have them contact Pat Gray, the new head of the FBI, and tell them to get the hell out of that part of the investigation right now.